So while we get set, Dr. Kuzger and I are not going to be liking each other on Monday morning because we're going to be talking about something that he doesn't like to talk about. That's breast cancer. <laughs> right? And for the strong women in our audience, can I get a, a show of hands and a round of applause, please? All right. Okay. So Karen, first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for keeping me. You know, I'm, I'm glad I finished my 90-day probation in, in decent shape. Okay. I am Dr. Gopala Krishnan, and I know I'm the girl here, so one of the oncologists, but the rest of us are here virtually with you. It's wonderful to meet everyone, and um, give me one second here. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Good. I feel like I'm in a Verizon commercial. Fantastic. Okay. So a little bit about me. Um, I actually started, I was an engineer-esque uh, at RPI. Went to Albany Med, then did my residency at UT Southwestern, did my fellowship at Vanderbilt, then did essentially a couple of years as faculty, um, part of University of Colorado and then University of Washington before coming here to Miami. So we're gonna actually have some fun today. We're gonna split the room into two, okay? I'm not gonna be talking this entire time. I need some audience participation because let's be honest, lunch was amazing and we're all about to fall asleep, okay? And we can't have that happen, right? Because it's breast month and it's breast cancer month and we need to talk about some things important. So this is gonna be a little bit different than Dr. Glickich's lecture. It's gonna be a little bit more participatory and we're gonna talk about common toxicities that we see in clinic, okay? Have I bored you guys yet? Show of hands. Okay, all right. So meet our first patient, Peggy. She is a tax attorney for the wealthy and moonlights as a guitarist at South Beach, okay? She comes to you, you are in my shoes, I've actually taken vacation, and you're, you're basically being Dr. Kuzner, Dr. Glickage, and myself for one day. She comes to you for follow-up. She was previously diagnosed with a left invasive ductal carcinoma. It was a T3 and 2, meaning she had lymph node involvement from her breast cancer. This was a triple negative. This was, this was an aggressive beast. It was ER, PR, and HER2 negative. She went through standard chemotherapy with dose-dense adromycin and, um, well, adromycin, cytoxin, and taxol. Um, and you notice that she was actually given taxol every two weeks for, you know, for the duration of her neoadjuvant treatment. And she completed treatment about three months ago. Okay. She then went and saw our amazing Dr. Paramo. By the way, his lecture was amazing, so let's get a round of applause for him. And um, he, she has a completion mastectomy one month ago, and then she achieved a pathological complete response. Oh, by the way, her in vitae was negative for BRCA1 and BRCA2, but it was notable for a check 2 and an ATM mutation. Now I'm not going to get into this can of worms because we're still working on this part of it, but stay tuned for next year. We'll talk about it next year, okay? And her chief complaint today when she comes to see you is, Doc, I've got a ton of peripheral neuropathy, and I just can't work. I'm having a hard time playing the guitar, and I love playing the guitar. So, like I said, we're going to split the room into two groups, okay? Those who, this is group A, and that's group B, okay? And the group that wins gets gold in terms of gold coins. I just don't have them today. They're not in my back pocket. I couldn't squeeze them in my back pocket for this presentation. But they will be, they will be handed to, to Karen next week. So what would you offer? Your options are, as Alex Trebek once said, duloxetine, oxybutynin, acetyl and L-carnitine, acupuncture, all of the above, the first choice, the second choice, the fourth choice, or none of the above. Okay, keep that in mind. We're not gonna give the answer yet. Okay, so let's change topics and gears a little bit. So we know neuropathy continues to be a major issue for a lot of our patients, and actually, I'm gonna actually use my pointer here and kind of talk. So we know that some patients actually get a baseline neuropathy um, from the get-go, even before they get chemotherapy. And what we also know is that some patients actually start to get more persistent neuropathy as time goes on. And we see this in patients who've actually gotten the combination of either taxotrotoxan or dose-dense ACT. Okay? So people much smarter than I was, 
um, decided to come up with some guidelines. And they decided to say, you know what, this is a major problem. Let's do something about it. So ASCO, which is the national body of all of medical oncologists, decided to, to look into this. And they created a set of guidelines in 2014, and then they updated it in 2020. Okay? The questions that they wanted to answer were, what do we do to prevent chemotherapy-induced neuropathies in adult cancer survivors, and how do we treat them? So unfortunately, here's the rub. There's no medicine that we have out there that can actually prevent chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. And we need more research to prevent chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. I just want to take a pause right here and just show you the amount of agents that have actually been studied. Now, none of these have actually been done in a prospective randomized study. A lot of these were retrospective. But this is a lot. I mean, this is like over 26, 30 agents that have actually been studied. So there's areas for improvement. So for our drug companies out there, maybe something to think about in the future. Just joking. Um, so how do we address neuropathy when people are getting treated? Well, my go-to is dose delaying, maybe dose reducing, or in some cases, stopping chemotherapy. But that's a really hard choice. So what about people who have completed chemotherapy? Well, we know that from randomized studies as well as some phase two trials, the deloxetine, which is an SSRI, SNRI, is actually effective. But a lot of these other medications, like you know, exercise, acupuncture, sclamber therapy. By the way, I did not know what sclamber therapy was prior to, prior to this. I'm still figuring that out. I'll get back to you next year. Um, gabapentin, uh, baclofen, amitriptyline, TCAs, and oral cannabinoids are actually not going to be effective. So. Like I said, there are a lot of smart people out there. And every year, women and men who love breast cancer get together at San Antonio. And we kind of decide on topics that are kind of chronically relevant. And this year, it's going to be still at San Antonio, but it's going to be December 7th to 10th. And I encourage everyone here to, to attend. Um, so I'm going to show you some things that actually came out last year um, at this meeting. Any questions so far? Everyone do, doing OK? Haven't bored you yet? OK, good. That means they're not firing me yet. That's a good thing. OK. So let's talk about this data that actually came out of the United Kingdom. So this was a, a study called Acufosin. It was acupuncture for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. It was by Dr. Wardley's group. OK? All right. So this was an open-label, randomized phase two study. It essentially occurred over 10 weeks. And they standardized patients to receive 40 minutes of weekly acupuncture sessions. And they actually did it based off of categorizing neuropathy. And I'll show you this on the next slide, um, based on where patients were experiencing neuropathy. And they actually had a grading system. The primary endpoint was essentially an improvement and a two-point improvement in a patient-reported survey um, on the neuropathy. So this is the tool that they actually used. So what it basically showed was they actually categorized essentially neuropathy based on symptoms. So numbness, pain, tingling, mobility, dexterity, cramps, and body parts. And then they actually gave it a score. Now, one thing to remember, this was an unblinded study. And they actually found that there was actually a significant improvement. So this is a standard of care alone arm. This is actually patients getting chemotherapy without anything. This is with, with a placebo. And then with acupuncture, they actually found, so I want to show you this, from 33% to 66%, suggests that there may be a signal there that actually this is really effective for our patients. But it was also a relatively small study. Remember that the total, let me go back here. The total people that were included in this study were 100 patients. So things to remember with the study, yes, there was a positive signal that this actually can work, but there was no blinding of the clinical assessors. So people like me were biased when they did the study. The other thing is we weren't really doing EMGs to figure out, are we really modulating pain at the neuropathic level and the nerve pain level? And there was also not a lot of follow-up. So this was done at 10 weeks, but we never looked at three months or a year afterwards to see, do we see actually an improvement long-term? So again, group A, group B. What would you guys offer? I've gone on vacation. Dr. Kuzner is not around. And Dr. Glickage is 
enjoying some time. I hear some murmurings. You know you can do this. Duloxetine. We've got one word for duloxetine. Would anybody do acupuncture? Huh, okay. So I would actually do the same thing. I would say duloxetine and I would advise my patients, you know, there is some new data out there for acupuncture, but we need a little bit more data to essentially see what kind of a benefit it's going to be long term. And we need more information long term as well. All right. So my next patient is Maria. And no, I'm not related to her, and she's not related to any of my family at Mount Sinai. So she is a 74-year-old female who presents for follow-up, OK? She's got right invasive ductal carcinoma. She, it was 0.3 centimeters. It did not spread to the nodes. It was ERPR positive, HER2 negative. Her family history was negative for any malignancies that she knows of. And she starts post partial mastectomy and adjuvant radiation. She decided, after a lot of talking with you and everything, to start endocrine therapy. And I, I'm going to open the can of worms today at this talk and talk about the fact that she's having menopausal symptoms. Now, show of hands, just so I can understand and, and kind of gauge, how many people have actually encountered this in their clinical practice? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So it's actually a pretty common problem. So what would you offer this lady? Remember, pot of gold, I'm just saying. OK, think about it. You don't have to have an answer just quite yet, OK? Um, so menopausal symptoms, let's take a step back. So this is actually something that we see a lot of in our clinical practices. And I, I call it the triad. So you've got hot flashes, which is something that we see not only in our breast cancer patients, but they, we also see it in primary care as well with our, a lot of our primary care colleagues. Vaginal dryness is another aspect of it. And then the one biggie that seems to discontinue, make patients discontinue their treatment is myalgias. What we know about these symptoms and we know about the biology of these symptoms is that the lack of estrogen actually leads to, quote unquote, a, maybe from chemotherapy, a chemical ovarian failure. Or you can essentially have a shutdown of the a reproductive access, and so as a result, you're not producing as much estrogen, and you can see this with our anti, or rather with our endocrine therapies as well. We know that this, this triad leads to essentially a decreased adherence and then stopping of these drugs as well. So let's talk about the first one. The, one, the first one I feel like is the one that I see most in practice. So it can be either due to ovarian ablation um, or suppression, either from chemo or endocrine therapy, such as tamoxifen and AI. We know that in the past that duloxetine and gabapentinoids have actually been proven to be effective. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of these three therapies that we're going to talk about in just a bit. So they decided to take 150 women. So let me take a step back. So this was actually a French group. They decided, you know, we've got a 150 women. We're essentially going to ask the question, what additional treatments can we use to help with hot flashes? in these women, OK? So a couple things. Oxybutynin, what is it? So it's a medication that we use to actually treat overactive bladder. It blocks acetylcholine, and it's actually shown to be effective for overactive bladder. So this was a randomized, double-blinded study. We took 150 women who were essentially having 28 hot flashes for more than 30 days, OK? We then essentially randomized these women into three groups. One was we said they're just going to get a placebo or a pill. They're either going to get two and a half milligrams of oxybutynin, or they're going to get five milligrams of oxybutynin. We assessed essentially the efficacy of this medication in two ways. One is we assessed, we had them fill out essentially a survey, like the survey that you're going to fill out on us at the end of today. Um, and we looked at essentially a weekly essentially hot flash score prior to treatment, midway through, and then at the end of six weeks. OK? And we wanted to see essentially a change in the hot flash score between each of the oxybutynin doses and then placebo. And then we also wanted to assess whether or not intervening with oxybutynin actually decreased hot flashes, and did it improve quality of life as well. So here's the spoiler. It actually seems to work. 
Okay, so what we found was essentially this is so this is the y-axis, right? And so what what we're showing right here is this is the percentage of women who essentially had a high hot flash score, and we're looking at so I know this is a little small, but this is at least at baseline. This is at six weeks, which is the end of treatment. What we're the first group that you're seeing here is essentially the group that got nothing. Okay, and you can see that there was a reduction in hot flashes as time went on, and then what you found essentially was that. Uh, two and a half milligrams daily, or rather twice a day, seem to actually lower the amount of hot flashes, but five milligrams seems to be the sweet spot. And we saw this also when you kind of compare it in the opposite way from a bar graph style, it was almost, if you think about it, when we calculate the math, it's about a 50% reduction. But oxybutynin, when you titrate it, can actually have some side effects, and those include dry mouth, difficulty urinating, and abdominal pain. Ay, 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 ay. So, what do I tell my patients? Well, I, I start most of my patients actually in practice at two and a half milligrams twice a day, and we kind of reassess and we see. And then, if they're able to tolerate it, what we've actually been shown is actually we go up to five milligrams twice a day. So, the another thing is something where is Regina? I'm looking for my favorite lady, Regina Malcor. All right, she just stepped out. So, the other thing we asked was, you know, what if we used cognitive behavioral therapy, which has actually been shown to be very effective as an adjunct therapy for of, in other areas for hot flashes? And so what we did was we took women um, who were younger than the age of 50 at the time of diagnosis, um, and they had to have at least 10 hot flashes and night sweats in the past week. We gave them the option of talking to a therapist and, and looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, looking at self-managed kind of cognitive behavioral therapy or not doing nothing at all. And here's the kicker. 70% of these women had started their endocrine therapy. And this is what they don't tell you on the study, um, is they started it, it was actually within a month of starting endocrine therapy. And what we did was we did a six-week program and inter internet-based psychoeducation and behavioral monitoring and cognitive reconstruction. Well, sorry, re restructuring. The food was so good that I forgot to start speaking after food. So sorry about that. And what we actually found is it does work. Now the question becomes is can you use this as an adjunct to other therapies? That's where I, you know, the data is still pending at this point, okay? This is something I want to talk about next, myalgias. Now I don't know about you, but show of hands, I feel like myalgias are the number one reasons why my patients in practice tell me, Dr. Gopal, I don't want to take endocrine treatment. Is that true? Yeah? So um, I, I saw this study. It was actually published by one of my co-residents. Uh, his name is Arjun Gupta. And he said one in three women, they actually surveyed oncologists across the country, and they actually sent out a survey. Um, and this was actually pre presented in JCO. And they asked about, I think, 100 women you know, how many of them stopped treatment because of myalgias? And it was one in three to one in five, depending on the institution. So that's 33%, so 20% to 33% uh, of patients stopping their endocrine therapy because they did not want to tolerate with the myalgias. Okay, so that's a biggie. One of the reasons why this happens, and I was actually looking this up last night, we actually don't know the ideology, but it's actually thought that essentially when you stop or block estrogen, you actually block some of the protective effects that it has on your knees. So estrogen in women, and this is not part of my slide set, but actually helps with nociception. And it helps, helps with nociception in terms of your joints and your back and depletion of estrogen, and I can see someone nodding with me because she's probably already read this or has, may have had, yeah, may have seen this, is it can lead to back pain primarily because essentially you're blocking the nociception, or rather, you're not providing pain relief with having enough estrogen around. And so depletion of estrogen leads to an increase in pain because you don't have a protective barrier. Now, there's a lot of cytokines involved and all of that, and that's, that's beyond the scope of our talk for today, but maybe for next year we'll talk about it, okay? And so one of the things that I've seen is essentially that the course can be variable. It can be joint pain, it can be um, you know, joint stiffness. 
You can even, I've actually seen one case of this with carpal tunnel syndrome requiring, you know, sometimes even like a, like a release if needed, and then really bad myalgias, okay? So other than, we know that Tylenol and NSAIDs work, but they only work to a limited extent. And a lot of times our patients tell us, Dr. Gopal, thank you, but no thank you, I'm not taking this medicine anymore. So we actually, and this is kind of really interesting because before 2018, there were not a lot of prospective studies that actually looked at interventions in which we could actually attack these endocrine-associated myalgias. And this was a study that was done by Hirschman and it was actually published in JAMA in 2018. And what they did was they took essentially close to about 200 to 300 women, and essentially what they did, these were most postmenopausal women, they essentially put them into three groups, okay? One was at least a waitlist group, kind of like a control group. The second was they, the second group received true acupuncture, very similar, it was 40 sessions over the course of um, a few weeks. And then there was a sham acupuncture where essentially it was almost like a placebo kind of an injection. And what they found was that just the fact that they were attempting acupuncture did improve it, improve pain outcomes and myalgia outcomes. Now, here's the one thing to remember about this study, okay? In all of these studies that I'm presenting you, they're not as sexy, and I don't like using that word, but in that they're not randomized double-blinded studies necessarily. So sometimes the people who are actually doing this are aware of you know, who, which patient goes in which group. And so you are seeing a little bit of potentially an observer's bias when you see this. But there was actually an improvement when it came to based on SWOG and improvement in pain outcomes as well. And it was interesting because the percentage of patients who actually had an improvement, that's what the y-axis here shows, um, by at least two points on the pain scale, in those who received true acupuncture, that's the group that I really want you to focus on, was about 67% compared to those who didn't receive anything, which was essentially down to 15%. So there is some thought process there that this may actually work. Now, we also know that duloxetine does work as well, and actually, we've actually seen that this actually can work. So, as I kind of start to wind down my talk, how do I manage, you know, AI associated uh, myalgias in my practice. So I start most of my patients on endocrine therapy. And then we kind of do, I, I usually do either a week follow up or I'll do a month follow up and I'll check vitamin D levels because it's been shown that vitamin D actually and the initiation of vitamin D can actually help with some of these symptoms. When they start developing myalgias, we, we basically say, you know, for mild myalgias, I would do essentially exercise and weight loss is kind of what we talk about. And then for moderate to severe arthralgias, um, I talk about you know, NSAIDs, weight loss, and duoxetine. The AI switch, and this is kind of interesting, you know, it, a lot of experts across the country have actually asked, when do you switch for the AIs? The consensus is, you know, once patients fail all three, or even the acupuncture data that I showed you, that's when we would really entertain either stopping the medication or switching it to an AI, to another AI. So, you guys are the doctors. I'm going on vacation. Help me figure out what you would do for this patient. What, is, what do you guys want to do? Okay, so we've got one vote for exercise. Okay. I hear a combo, so I, I would actually do more of the combo based on her symptoms, okay? Last but not least, how many of you have actually experienced this question? I feel like not only our nurses, not only us as physicians, but I also feel like our very important clinical staff who's sitting right in front of me here get this all the time. Doc, what supplements can I take when I take my hormone treatment and chemotherapy? Is that, is that a fair estimation? I feel like this is something I get maybe four times a day, five times a day? All the time, right? Thank you. So it turns out that there are some drugs or supplements that you shouldn't take at the same time with other drugs. And a lot of times you have a drug-to-drug -drug interaction. So um, this is actually adapted from the MassGen um, community website and the education website. But this is something that I kind of, edu kind of educate my patients on. So 
If you're starting in AI, I tell them not to take black cohosh, um, ginseng, red clover, or St. John's wort, especially with the XMS team. Okay. And that, my friends, is the end of my talk. Dr. Kuznir, we know, you know we love you. We know colorectal cancer is really important, but we have to be women and we have to celebrate October. And so in the spirit of October, and men as well, sorry about that, you know, male breast cancer is equally important. Please get your mammograms. Trust me, I am after my own family members for this. And let's educate our patients to get their mammograms this month, okay? Thank you, guys. Man, I feel so lucky to be here. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, you know, coming to Mount Sinai has been truly amazing. And, and I can't thank Dr. Kuznir and Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Glickage and, and the entire team here. Um, I feel like I, I even though my, my family's not here in the audience, I feel like I do have a family in the audience. And that's because I can look across the room and I can see my family members across the room. Um, you know, I just wanted to put this out there because I also wanted to give a shout out to someone who couldn't be here today, or I hope he's here today, and that is um, Aaron Simpkins. He's one of our new partners. He's going to be out at Hylia. While we do have two amazing locations at Miami Beach and Aventura, we're also expanding our services out to Hylia, and he is an amazing oncologist. So I just wanted to give him a shout out as well. But that's it. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you for your time. Thanks for not firing me yet. Appreciate it.